Star Citizen's AI is now making fantastic progress, while Squadron 42's development marches on. We find out what Cloud Imperium have been working on over the last few weeks in regards to their single player campaign, Squadron 42, what have their various development teams been up to. We are also looking at the AI updates here as well, which are very relevant to both Squadron 42 and Star Citizen. So let's start with that. AI content focused on new medical behaviors, creating three new usables. Sitting angled console, a desk where NPCs can sit and do admin work, such as checking on patients' medical records. Examine spots on either sides of the medical bed, allowing doctors to approach a patient and diagnose their condition. This will include the use of both data pad and hand scanners and a medical fridge where medicine is stored. For now, NPCs will visually inspect the stock level and enter information on a data pad. Eventually, they will restock when quantities of medicine are low. They also continued to work on the chow line usables and resumed work on the food vendor from last year. Along with this, AI content continued to improve general locomotion realism by taking the overlay animations worked on last month and categorizing them by frequency. For example, coughs and sneezes will play 10% of the time, head stretches 40% of the time, and more extensive bolder actions like checking the movie glass will happen 30% of the time. They are currently designing a priority system to trigger these animations. They should all together make the world feel more alive. The AI feature team are implementing the trait system, which allows them to specialize AI characters using behavior logic by either limiting or favoring certain behaviors. For example, an AI with the cautious trait will prefer moving from cover to cover when approaching the target, whereas the aggressive trait will have them directly move towards the target, ignoring available cover. Other traits including gunners who prefer to use turrets, medics who aid allies by healing them, and addicts who use stim drugs whenever available. The core system has been implemented and several traits are now in place. Further traits will be implemented once corresponding behaviors are developed. With the basis of the investigation behavior implemented, the team moved to implementing group investigation, which involves sharing potential hiding locations between AI characters searching for the same target. This behavior is built from the token system that allows multiple AIs to collaborate by pooling resources and was developed with future use in mind. The generic shared data, in this case hiding location, can be specialized for specific use cases and as NPCs move around the room, they determine and share which hiding locations have been seen so that other NPCs won't revisit them, which is very interesting as a thing because if you're aware of that, then you could potentially move from a place that they haven't visited to one that they have and then be safe there. From a simple implementation comes quite complicated results with NPCs now moving to cover the room as you would expect them to do in real life. A new system related to both features has been implemented, the firing token. When several AIs are targeting the same character and want to fire, they request one of a limited number of shared tokens. If they're successful, they will be able to fire. However, if there are no tokens available, they will not fire and may consider alternative behaviors such as moving to cover. This allows the team to further control the pressure placed on a player while also generating covering fire behaviors, as some characters will fire whilst others are moving. Traits were also implemented to suppress requiring the firing token in different ways. So the first is to ignore the firing token completely, which means that the character will be able to fire without reducing the number of available tokens, which can be used for boss characters. The second is to allow for a specific AI character to always get a firing token, giving them the priority without increasing the number of firing enemies. Development of the AI perception system continued throughout August, ensuring that escalation of threats in the perception meter can be controlled by tweaking the setup in Dataforge. A new sixth sense perception range was also developed to control gameplay when the player is sneaking up behind enemy characters. The perception meter now allows the devs to generate gameplay for stealth kills rather than stealth killing being an easy option as the player must minimize the amount of time they're in close range before they're noticed. On the animation side, AI features 
polished the female human combat animations and created blocker animations for the improved sharp turn functionality. They also continued polishing vandal search and investigation animations, including specific search locomotion animations. They said, the AI feature team have been hard at work at developing lots of different features. This is partly due to strong foundations of our AI code that were available by spending a long time thinking about future functionality. As a team, we've grown and we've been improving the communication between our team and the designers through shared language, documentation and regular meetings. Through this, we've been able to take their vision and make it a reality. AI tech continue to extend and implement new functionalities for NPCs traversing navigation areas. One of the improvements allows the designers to specify the opening width of a door a navigation link and use that information during the pathfinding step. Now NPCs will use the entire width of a door, not just the center. They also began extending ladder functionality by creating new navigation link adapters and movement blocks so that AI characters can use them in similar ways to the players. AI tech also progressed with the NPC movement refactor. Specifically, they worked on a better separation of how logic is processed when animated characters and actors' states are updated. This allows them to correctly handle the actor LOD system, which can have both parts of a character updating at different rates. The overall movement refactor also went through a review process and intensive QA testing in preparation for its release. Further iterations were made on the NPC seamless transitions prototype. This involved ironing out small positions and pose props when handling animation control between different systems and adding support for selecting the best usable enter animation based on which has the best enter pose requiring the least warping. The subsumption editor tool was opened up to more designers so they could go through some more intensive and in-depth functionality and performance testing. Bugs and feedback from users were addressed and performance improvements began when loading bigger mission graphs. A new feature for ship combat behaviors, ship pilot perception, was extended to include vision alongside radar signals. This will allow NPC and AI ships to react to hostile characters on foot and engage them in combat. AI tech continued developing and improving reinforcement and disembarking behaviors. Part of this involved allowing missions to designate points where the squad group will go and investigate in case hostiles aren't visible. Animation worked on usable first reactions, so this ensures that usables have a reaction set assigned to them. They also continued with the female spec ops work to get the female buddy and enemy AIs in game. EVA and Zero G were further developed with focus on attaching characters and moving through tight spaces. Work on helmets continued as did the ladder improvements. Vandals searching for players, the chow line, medical bed and custom animation locomotion work progressed through the month. Tasks were completed for worker facial animations and scenes including assets for the med table. Part of the team continued to solve mocap from their backlog. The majority of the team, however, worked on stage building and prepping for narrative and marketing shoots. Character art and tech art continue to develop the Screaming Gallison's armor and remaining Navy uniforms. They were also working on an internal head scan and cleanup process, proving out a new pipeline using tools developed by the tech animation team. Tech animation began consolidating all new heads and they're, they're going to appear in game. This involves processing a lot of the old and new data with alignment to deliver on the requirements for both parts of the game. So far, 60 heads need to be scanned, created, rigged and integrated into the DNA gene pool to achieve this vision. Weapons art continued to develop the vault weapons mentioned in last month's report with the main modeling pass completed in August. They then moved on to refining the iron sights to improve the on-screen positioning. New Screaming Gallison's melee weapons were grey boxed and are currently having their setup and initial animations worked on to ensure the new metrics work well. Several new skins were kicked off and the team also converted a number of weapons to the current tint system to allow for the creation of future skins. VFX concept art completed the first pass on new weapon effects and helped the artists visualize a complex scene involving a powerful energy source. Gameplay features are working on a new framework for the Mobiglass, which will make use of the building box system better and new UI cards the tech teams have been developing. This will then host all of the new apps being built for Squadron 42. New functionality was added to determine when players are in social areas and change the field of view to differentiate 
between them from combat situations. For players, hints and tutorials, new conditions were added to give the designers additional flexibility when they want to trigger them. A new system is also being developed to allow players to control overhead cranes. This could be expanded to allow players to remote control moving drones too. Really looking forward to that coming to the persistent universe at some point. Uh, the FPS level design team began taking five chapters to a more complete state with a continued focus on stability. They also tested the first third of the game with the intention of giving players a seamless playthrough. Like the FPS team, the space and dogfight teams continued to focus on getting a larger part of the game fully playable with functional systems and mechanics alongside creating a seamless experience. They continued with scene setup, bug fixing and addressing review feedback, as well as refactoring and streamlining pieces as necessary. This will make all tasks easier from working on chapters to devising checkpoints. Gameplay Story worked on two new scenes, the first being a piece that connects to a cinematic scene and features Marines cheering, the second involves a medic helping a wounded miner. Following feedback, they also created a new tram arrival with Mo cap being planned to allow two key characters to board it smoothly. Narrative planned any additional content they'd need to capture and they reviewed and reiterated on various sections of gameplay. Cinematics completed the implementation work for major sequences in chapters 1, 5 and 7. This included lengthening the opening shot of the campaign. The vandal movement style was also finalised and prior block outs received more fluid motion and precise timing. Adjustments were made to a few scenes on the Javelin Bridge which was recently lengthened for FPS combat. Further work went into the timing of a large weapon. Further work was done to Chapter 5 on a tram ride, with the team working alongside the physics programmers to get little handles and characters to sway when the tram accelerates. Other work involved a mining tick landing and walking to be unloaded, a meet-up with a friendly character, an elevator ride, and a tram accident. Really looking forward to seeing that stuff in-game, because for me, if I have the sort of some of the scenes reminiscent of the original Half-Life tram opening scene, I'm going to be very happy. Uh, a scene in Chapter 7 received polish, which included a lot of smaller details. These included handcuffs, a multi-tool folding out and cutting, and the handing over of a med pen that required a small amount of new code from the Squadron 42 team. They said, Usually, when creating scenes with characters grabbing, unholstering, giving, or using items, we aim to solve it with proper systemic implementations. So, the actor action track in the sequencer tells the character to actually unholster the item, grab it, then hand it over to the other character. In this scene, we had the added difficulty of a stocked weapon being held while giving a med pen. In this instance, the user action confused the giver and given hand, so we often ended up handing over a rifle instead of a pen. A small code fix to specify left and right hands for both giver and receiver fixed this. The team also worked on Chapter 11, which needs multiple destruction set pieces, so the VFX team provided sophisticated Houdini-authored simulated destruction and dot C. GAs that can house up to a thousand debris pieces and still run relatively lightweight versus a typical brute force approach. They were then added alongside adjusted camera and timing shots to frame the scene. Boom! That's it for your Squadron 42 and Star Citizen AI monthly report summary this time. I am interested to know what you think. When do you think we could see Squadron 42 episode 1? Do you think that some of those AI improvements will be making their way into the Persistent Universe next year. If you want to watch my video on the Star Citizen Persistent Universe specific monthly report summary, um, check out my links below. If you're interested in potentially using your eyes more for eye tracking in Star Citizen, uh, you can get 20% off the Toby Eye Tracker at the moment. Uh, use my links below for that as well. Whatever your thoughts though, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. I'm Nord Catchem, and it's my mission to become a Nord Master. Oh no, it's Team Hacksaw! Hacksaw uses trackers and blocks your ability to go on websites like Netflix and watch the content that you want to on Netflix? Question mark. Go Nordy Chew! Nordy Chew uses nordvpn.com slash boardgamer. It is super effective. He beats Team Hacksaws and he becomes a NordVPN master, a Nordimon master.
Fortunately, with NordVPN, you don't need to catch them all. You just need to get a subscription from nordvpn.com slash boardgamer. Links below. Every month we have a ship giveaway, and for September we're giving away three ships, one each to three different lucky winners, the Origin 100i, the 125a, and the 135c. Any of these solid starter ships will allow you just to jump in to Star Citizen and play right away. All you need to do is comment on any of my videos made during the month to be in for a chance of winning one of those. More details in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to further support the channel, consider using the join button under my videos or becoming a Patreon. Either way, you'll get access to some exclusive content and have more of a voice in shaping the channel. A huge thank you to anyone that already does that. You are amazing. I love you. Zin also is contractually obliged to love you. There is a link for donations and all that jazz in the description below as well if that is your preferred medium. It is super appreciated genuinely. Once again, thanks very much for watching and I'll see you in the verse.